So the title of our talk is uh, uh, America, This Buds For You. According to our silly titles, which is probably on a screen, we're uh, uh, very fancy. David Hartman likes to make fun of me about that for my silly titles. We both have silly global titles, but we're really just doing uh, fun things that are a partnership for a brand that we're going to talk to you a little bit about. The title is America, This Buds For You. It's really about the AIGA today, and so we're going to talk to you guys about that. It's going to be fun. It's going to be about Budweiser. It's going to be about connection. The theme is all about connecting, so today we can connect. Uh, we're going to talk about how clients work with agencies, and we have a lovely client here in an a, a unnamed by Debbie branding symposium called Branding with Clients. <laughs> so we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to talk about business challenges that brands have and how creativity can help solve them. We're going to talk about brands and their connection with people, because that's what we're here to do. Uh, we're going to put the we back in Budweiser. Uh, we are Lauren. Lauren, hi. I'm the global brand director of Budweiser, as Debbie said. Was that, was, that was an easy intro. Yeah, uh, I I'm am Tosh. Quick. Debbie already did the intro. I am some sort of global creative directory type that works on Budweiser a lot. I didn't have a t-shirt because they didn't have any more black ones, so you get to wear the t-shirt. We meant to dress alike. That's yes. okay. Uh, we're going to talk about Budweiser. Do you want to drive? I would. OK. So before we get into this amazing case study that both of us are so, so proud of, I just want to explain to you guys a couple of facts about Budweiser that you probably don't know, especially if you are American, uh, as myself when I first came into the brand. So Budweiser is the world's most valuable alcohol brand, according to Interbrand. This came out last year. So we're very, very proud of this fact. Um, Budweiser is massive. We are enjoyed in 85 countries. Um, and actually, as of two years ago, we now sell more beer abroad than we do in the US. So we are very international. And after our acquisition of SAB Miller last year, we are now sold in, I think it's nine new countries this year. So Nigeria, South Africa, Australia, Colombia, Ecuador, it goes on and on. So we are continuing to expand. Um, and we're doing very well. We're growing uh, like wildfire. So in Brazil, which is our fourth biggest market, double-digit growth. In UK, uh, double-digit growth again. And then China, which is our number one market, we're still growing double digits there as well. Um, and again, in terms of beverages, we are the number three beverage company in the world behind Coke and Pepsi. So that's something that we're super, super proud of. And growing two times faster than our biggest competitor uh, globally, which is Heineken. So just a couple things to kind of set the stage. So we, we really are the number one beer brand in the world. So no small task when it comes to design for my friend Tosh here. We are the king. <laughs> <laughs> but how did we get here? Why is that? What, what is it that is fueling this growth? Um, I think Tosh took out some of my slides, but I can't help myself. <laughs> Um, so Budweiser is a, a very special brand when it comes to the beer. Uh, we are one of the most expensive beers to brew, uh, and that's really something that comes through in the, the experience that consumers have with it. Um, we brew twice as long as most other beers because we age in giant beechwood lager tanks for 21 days. And that's something that uh, costs a lot of money and a lot of time, uh, but we do it everywhere in the world, so we're very proud of that. Um, every Budweiser that you taste in any single country will taste exactly the same. We are incredibly consistent and have been that way for 140 years. So all of these things um, served as inspiration, I think, for, for where we ended up. So I'll turn it to you. Sure. This has been uh, a journey, I think, with us and Budweiser for, I think, five years. And so all those beautiful stats and amazing things that Lauren has talked about and the growth of the brand is exciting, but it's been a collaboration. And it didn't start... Uh, it didn't start from this amazing place. I mean, it's an amazing brand, but, you know, it came from somewhere. They were the first innovator, I think, in this space. We think about technology now as being uh, the kind of thing du jour, but pasteurizing beer and distributing things nationally, refrigerating for the first time, the first beer that the president drank after Prohibition, firsts, 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 lots of things. We were the first beer to sell 30 million barrels, 40 million barrels, 50 million barrels. And in 1960, three to four beers consumed in the US were Budweiser's. Don Draper was drinking a Budweiser. That's when we were at our cultural peak. <laughs> but in 2014, when we started work with the brand, only one in seven had even tried 
a Budweiser in this country between the ages of 21 and 25. How many of you are in that age group? Millennials. <laughs> Watch out. The Z's are coming. They're going to get you. <laughs> so you better catch up and drink some Budweiser's before they come out. But the point was that we had fallen out of relevance, even though we were a cultural icon and connecting with the world and everything you've ever seen. And Don Draper was drinking our beer. And three to four beers in 1960 were consumed in the US for Budweiser's. No one was tasting us. Huh. That's tough. What are we going to do? <laughs> we need to think about it. We need to drink more Budweiser's and work on our briefs. And we thought to ourselves, what is Budweiser in the mind? Because if all that stuff is happening, close your eyes and think about not John Senna, but what Budweiser is. What is it in your mind that makes it great? Shout it out. Or don't. <laughs> in the mind, you close your eyes and you think of something. Uh, I learned this from Brian Collins. You have to have swag. So we brought some swag, and we're going to wing it into the audience so you can have some. Because when you think about Budweiser in your mind, watch your eyes. You think about certain things. You think about bow ties. You think about hats. Uh-oh, that's a hard one. Oh, sorry. T-shirts. I need a T-shirt oh, cannon. They don't fly very well. <laughs> oh. I'm trying. Brian, help me with the swag. I know. Brian knows how to do this better. <laughs> we will have more swag. <laughs> yes. Wing it, Brian. Here we go. Woo. Yes. When you think about Budweiser, you think about certain things. This is not what you think about. You don't think about this experience in the hand. You don't think about that particular bottle or that can. And when we got the brief, it was very confusing because this had been launched in different countries. In Brazil, the Brazilians were confused. Why does the can look like that and the bottle look like that? We said to ourselves, what is Budweiser in the mind? It's an amazing label. It's been around for 140 years. As much as we didn't want to talk about it at the time, it's an American brand. Iconic advertising and an amazing symbol. We had a business challenge that in the rest of the world, Budweiser was growing everywhere. In the US, steep decline. And it's weird. No one's drinking it. No one's talking about it, but they're wearing it. Everybody's wearing Budweiser. Why is that? Why is this in culture? Why is that Supreme shirt selling for $400, but no one drinks a Budweiser? It's weird. Why are they selling these cool shirts and cool bags and cool kids are wearing Budweiser stuff, but they won't drink it? You have cool Jordans in Budweiser, but no one's drinking it. It's because this world does not equal that world. That looks like NASCAR. This looks cool. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it had a ziggy zaggy kind of weird thing going on. And we said, it's simple. Just go back to what made you great. It's harder than you think to convince people to do that. Sometimes you have to test things. So what we like to do, and they're great clients, they'll test things without testing things by putting it in the market and seeing if it's successful. And here's the first thing we launched. I never let uh, the truth get in the way of a good story. She always says those, those aren't accurate. That wasn't quite right. wasn't quite that, but. <laughs> it's close. Tell us which was the real Well, you can ask us in our, in our portion, but uh, I, I think. <laughs> I'm trying to wow you right now. <laughs> I, I, I think that, uh, I, I, you know, you, you, you see certain things. And that was the first thing in our minds that take Budweiser from a place that wasn't connecting with culture to something that just felt cool again. I didn't steal your slides. I put them in a different place. Good. Cool. Thank you. I think, oh, OK. I don't remember what's next. <laughs> um, so as I said before, we take great pride in the way that we brew our beer. And so 
this, this really was kind of the core of, of the brief was we, we put so much effort and care and money and resources into the way we brew and it's not translating into that experience that consumers have in their hands at the shelf, as Tosh said, in their minds there's a certain brand that uh, people are really excited about that they want to wear and that they want to be a part of but they don't want to actually consume and so that was basically the, the challenge. Um, again, brewed twice as long, aged longer, brewed over beechwood, blah, 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 blah. Um, but we're not communicating that on pack. So I will let Tosh tell the story. Can you imagine that this is what it looked like across the globe? A giant global brand, but different in every country, different everywhere. That's China, Russia, Brazil, America, different everywhere. And the experience we had with it was if we talk about quality, we have to treat our brand with the same level of quality. You know, like we said, this is uh, maybe the 1990s and desktop publishing revolution gave us the Photoshop button that made us push the drop shadow and push the beveling and push the tilty thing. And then the label had been around for 140 years and how did it get there? Why is this the image we show for the brand? Why is the red sweaty? <laughs> I, is the beer red? I, I, no. Is the logo cold? No. So it's just simple. It needs to work in a modern place. It needs to live on a 60 by 60 pixel screen. It needs to be put on the backfield of any stadium. It needs to be projected from space. It has to work. It has to be well crafted. The label is probably one of the most recognized labels in the world. And this is how we cracked the code with the client. We said you can create it in Microsoft Word. Outside of that unique B, the, the most prolific desktop publishing platform on earth can create the Budweiser label. That does not seem right. <laughs> there was a time when Budweiser was more than premium quality, it was Budweiser quality, a level that could be better than Microsoft Word. There was a time in the archives, amazing archive, probably second only to Coca-Cola, it's incredible to have uh, Smithsonian archives with white gloves, you can see everything. And we looked, and what did we found? the same label, the same craft, the same care, until really the computer. Everyone was able to draw things by hand and put the same effort into the brand as they could into the beer. So we just went through it and looked at all the amazing bits. And it's an exercise in reduction and redrawing and taking the kind of photocopied photocopy and crafting it by hand and hiring real artisans to create real type and draw things with care that matter. And if the beer matters and it's good, and quality, then we should have things that look that way. And there's, you know, it's not a huge overhaul. It's simple. Just every single little detail. 14 pieces of custom type, 14 uh, unique hands drew it, everything crafted by a person, eventually digitized and created it out of home typefaces that work. But it's creating the craft of our, our field and applying it to the craft of brewing and the craft of branding. And we launched some beautiful packaging The next thing we had to tackle was, it's a campaign-driven world, and the campaigns are created by different agencies, by different people, in different markets for different needs. And we're not treating our brand like our beer. It's all over the shop, it doesn't make any sense. So, with our partners at Anomaly, brought back this Buds For You, which is a great tagline from 40 years ago. It helps us that Bud's in the name, but we're trying to make it as iconic as other pieces of type. So we found the original bottle, created an alphabet, did it in every language. We're still trying to work on Chinese, but it's like 6,000 characters, and it's crazy. I know you guys are saving up for it. We're gonna get it done. <laughs> the point is that anywhere you go, if the beer tastes the same, if they care about it, and everywhere has the same experience in packaging, in liquid, shouldn't it be the same experience in campaign? It's a beer that you might have seen, and it's not about uh, the fussy micro, -brew micro brews of the world. It's big. It's not for sipping, it's for enjoying. It's having a little fun with the, the iconography. It's being brewed the hard way and proud to be who you are. I love that line the best, the official beer of beers. And so we created a system, super simple. We arrived with nothing and built an empire. Here's a cool video. We drove culture and permeated the world around us. We were America's beer.
Our enemies wanted a piece of what was ours. So ask yourself, when your throne is under threat, what's a king to do? Take back your crown. Most of these presentations are easy to give because we can just play videos. So you're going to see a couple more quickly and then we're going to tell you more about it. So one of the big things is you have to get consistent. So if the beer is consistently brewed, the branding should be consistent. And we had a lot of talk today earlier about being consistent but flexible, being able to be variable in the world. And if we just did that all the time, it would be super boring. So how do you connect and do things in a Budweiser way that are a little bit different? and try to be flexible. So the next thing we ask ourselves is can we be flexible and connect what it means to be Budweiser with another big icon? Lauren said that one's true. That one, yeah, that one was true. Sweet. Those matches were never launched, though. I really wanted a set of those matches. I don't know why you guys never made them. I guess you're not in the matches business. We had to prioritize. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, so as agencies, you're probably, as designers, as clients, you're probably wanting to repeat success. So if you enjoyed the aluminum, if you enjoyed, oh, we're getting, we're getting the Oscar call, ruh -ruh. If you enjoyed uh, uh, that aluminum with the Statue of Liberty, Give me another one. Can I have another package? And we said we could do. That's cool. Uh, but instead, for the Olympics, let's use our style and highlight all the athletes we're going to sponsor. And instead of just putting on a package, let's put it on New York City's biggest. Then, that was, well, that was summer 2016. Anyway, so around the second half of 2015, we said, oh, wow, the summer of 2016 is a really big moment for America. It's an election year. We're hosting, or not hosting, but we'll be in the Olympics. 
Uh, there was a lot of things going on in culture that were very related to, to being American. And so, so the brief was, how can we, as a, a brand that's very associated with America, be a part of this conversation in a very relevant way? How do we tell our story? How do we be relevant? That's a lot of the things we've been doing. How do we create a conversation? And can we use design as our biggest weapon? Because they have a huge marketing mix, and design is not maybe the biggest tool or media spend. Can it be bigger? So if we were relevant with this, and iconic with this, is there something that connects us as a brand? We think so. We think it's freedom. It's the idea that freedom's a universal motivator, and around the world, people want to be free. And Budweiser has a creed. America has a constitution. So. With great clients, we were able to change everything, all that type that we did, to be what it is to be American. We changed everything on Budweiser's label, everything, to reflect what it is to be from the American culture. Goodbye, Budweiser. Hello, America. Budweiser being renamed America. I that uh, Budweiser is going to temporarily change its name to America. It's renaming its beer America. They will rename their beer America. This summer, you can hold a can of ice-cold America in your bare hand. For six months, Budweiser will be called America. I think this is a fantastic marketing idea. America, that bud's for you. I'm not sure how much time we have left. You're giving me zero. So oh. we, could, we could very well end there. Uh, and Debbie can ask us questions, because that's probably the biggest piece of work that we did. We've done other things after that that are interesting. Feel free to check them out or ask Lauren uh, how she tolerated me for so long. Uh, so yeah, we can stop there if you want. Yeah. Oh no, I broke the clicker. And I only, I only have time for um, one or two questions. Um, but you said something really early on in your presentation that piqued my interest and sort of slid by. Um, you said that the brief was confusing. Oh, for sure. So, so how did you push back with Lauren? How did you get to a better brief? Uh, well, Lauren was not there. And that's the reason it was difficult. She, her predecessor <laughs> was there. And so I, you had her predecessor fired? <laughs> no, no, we, we created great work with him and he has moved on to other parts of the marketing mix. Okay, that's cool. But, so had, but talk about how you were able, you, you received a bad brief, well, and then what do you, what do, you do when that happens? Uh, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, we, we made a lot of mistakes and we learned from them. Uh, we went in arrogantly and gave them the answer. Uh, we went away to our black box for four weeks and did a bunch of design work that they rejected instantly and did not like. Uh, it made our jobs harder. It jeopardized our agency. We almost lost the business multiple times and it, we dug a huge hole for ourselves to climb out of. Wow, aren't you glad I asked that question? It, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> a, no it, was it was, Amazing that we were able to recover because we were such bastards. So why were you so arrogant? Why, why did you go in that place, way? Because we didn't, we didn't talk to the client. And to, to the credit of uh, the, uh, Lauren's predecessor, when we were having such a hard time, he said, uh, I, he basically wanted to fire us. And I called him up and said, we need to have a beer. And he's like, you want to have a beer now? What time was it? No, like it was like six or eight months deep into the project. Oh, and it was hard and painful. And I went up there. And the problem was we didn't talk. We had no communication, and we didn't uh, understand where they were coming from, understand the brief, challenge the brief, and talk about it in a way that was constructive. We just went into answer mode. And the nice thing is from that lesson that we've learned, we are able to communicate much better these days uh, so that it, when we get a brief, we can talk about it instead of just go into, uh, into action. How did you climb out of the hole? <laughs> 
I think that's, that's, that, that could be a whole other topic, but it was, uh, it was we, it, we probably didn't do it the right way. We worked and worked and worked and worked in the wrong direction and worked and worked and worked and worked in the wrong direction. In the end, we did what we thought was right, uh, but it, it took too long. And if we would have talked about it first, before we put pen to paper and got an alignment and trust from clients, I think we would have gotten there a lot faster and uh, there would have been less late nights. Do you think that, there, that your ability to recapture the trust was because of the ultimate creative that you did or because of a new way of forming the relationship? Or? It, was, it was all relationship because the, the, the creative was the same. Oh, wow. The first thing we showed got us fired and got us fired and got us rehired and got us rehired and went to market. Wow. It was all down to us and our interaction and doing, uh, not, not building trust and not doing a nice, uh, not doing what Lauren and I do now. Lauren, you mentioned before that um, the, the brand or the, 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 the actual beer itself tastes exactly the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's no small feat because even Coca-Cola tastes different in different parts of the world. How were you able to control the recipe and the water that is used to create the beer and to be able to create that consistency. It seems almost impossible. It is almost impossible. Well, part of it is that um, a lot of international brands are imported from a couple hubs. Um, we tend to brew locally everywhere that we go, uh, which is part of what I mentioned in terms of the expense. So we now have, I believe it's 57 breweries around the world, which is a, a lot. Um, so that helps because it can be managed locally. Um, and the other thing is just our quality standards. We have a very uh, <laughs> maniacally precise quality team that yell at me a lot for trying to do different things, but um, they are scientists and they are passionate brewers and they make sure that everything is exactly the same. It's remarkable. Did you know that the, the brewmasters win more awards than anybody else and the craft brewers of note call out that Budweiser has the best brewers? I did not It's know amazing. That. It's like they, they laud them as the, with their skill. Uh, and the fact that they can do it in 57 places internationally, and what, 12 in the US? Yes. Bravo. We should have brought beers. Uh, it was, okay. It's, a little it's five o'clock somewhere. Um, I'm being asked to wrap it up. Right, so cool. I want to say thank you, Lauren Rodriguez, Tosh Hall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.